text, uh, Romans chapter 13, uh, verse 1 through 10, uh, especially, we're talking about God, relationships, and you. This is the fifth lesson from this particular uh, series. I like to do series, especially when it's something that I can't just, I mean, I can get up here and do like Paul preached to midnight, but I don't know how many people will still be with me besides my wife. Uh, I want everybody to be, get the benefit of the lesson, amen. Well, she ain't going nowhere. <laughs> we got there understanding our relationship. <laughs> be on, baby, be on. <laughs> so, so I tried to stretch about in a series so we can get the lessons out, and I pray that this particular series here has been uh, very beneficial to you, talking about God, uh, the great God of heaven, uh, relationships, and us. And uh, those things that we see in our relationships, uh, starting out with relationship between God and man, we spoke about that. So let's look very briefly uh, this morning at Romans chapter 13, verse 8. It says, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. It says, For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not, uh, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, Namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Verse 10 says, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And we're talking about God relationships and us. We're talking about in our relationships, how that if we love like God says to love, we would not uh, breach one another. We would not conduct a breach upon one another. We would not uh, do anything out of the way in order to hurt one another. Now, sometimes we hurt one another by accident, and too often we do that, but we would never set out to hurt someone intentionally in our relationship, whatever that relationship may be. And we are speaking about different relationships in the Bible. Uh, we talked about, in the first lesson we looked at, uh, we talked about the relationship between God and man. And relationships are so, so very important to each and every one of us. They are so important in our lives and how we relate to God. And the very way and the very essence and how we relate to one another, it will have a, a, a an impact on whether or not we make heaven our home. And when we put away all the distractions that we deal with every day, as a child of God, I was simply trying to get home to my father. Now, what does this word relationship mean? Relationship is a particular type of a, a connection that exists between people related to or having dealings with one another. If you have dealings with one another, you relate to one another, the way you connect, that is what we are referring to when we're talking about uh, our relationships. And we have to understand, as I, as I just simply set the base real quick here, uh, God is the master of relationships. Uh, through his son, we remember Jesus Christ and his written word, we are able to look at relationships throughout God's word to get an idea of some of the relationships that individuals have with one another, uh, beginning with the relationship between God and man. And we can look at our relationships from a medical standpoint. Sometimes our relationships are in uh, good condition. And it's good, amen, to have a relationship with someone that can be uh, seen as good. Sometimes our relationships become undetermined. We really don't know what's going on in our relationships. Sometimes we can see them in a fire condition. Sometimes they are guarded or serious. Some relationships are even in a critical uh, condition. And some of our relationships, unfortunately, are in a terminal state. Some are grave, some are fatal. And then there's that relationship that once we realize that something is gone, has gone amiss in our relationship, something has gone wrong in our relationship, we can set about recovering in that relationship. And through God's word, we can recover in our relationships. Now, if you're in a relationship and your heart is intent and set on recovering that relationship, but the other party has no intention or no desire, then there's not a lot that can be done. But you still do your part. Because, you see, you're not going to be judged, amen, based on what someone else does in that relationship. That's not how God judges us. If I have a fallen out with someone, and I repent, and I go to them, and I ask for forgiveness, and I offer my apologies, and they refuse to forgive me, that is on that individual. Amen. I have done my part in rectifying the relationship. But I have to go and do it, amen. Amen. 
So relationships are very important. The first relationship, God created man in this image. From what we can read, we understand that God and man, they had a good relationship. God created the woman, amen, as a mate and helper to the man. From what we can read about the initial relationship between man and woman, they had a good relationship. But there was old Satan. He said, I'm going to throw a monkey wrench in all of that. So after looking at them and analyzing and studying and noticing, he saw their particular weaknesses and he saw their strengths and he made a breach upon that woman. He made a move against that woman and the woman went to man and made a breach against him and a move against him and the relationship between man and God was changed. The relationship between that man and that woman was changed forever. And God has fed them from the garden. Adam and Eve were blessed with two children, two Cain and Abel. And the relationship between Cain and Abel, from all that we can understand initially, it was a good relationship. But something happened along the way to the extent that Cain slew his very own sibling, his own blood, his own brother. Something happened. Something dreadful happened in that relationship. He slew his brother. But I want you to know that in our relationships between husband and wife, we have responsibilities one to one another. In our relationship between siblings, we have responsibility. In our relationship with our siblings, we ought to look out for our siblings. We don't look at, their, look at our shortcomings and destroy our siblings' accomplishments. We mourn for the loss of our siblings, not because of, not be the cause of their loss. We rejoice when they accomplish greatness. We do not become envious. That is a proper, before God, relationship between siblings. That you look out for one another, you, you care for one another. And then we look at the relationship between Noah and his sons. We talked about the relationship, brothers, on last week, between the father and the children. And in that relationship between the father and the children, I, I, I want you to understand the importance to, to know, to take with you that children are a gift from God and they ought to be treated as such and taken care of. Fathers are not to provoke their children, but they are to raise them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And the children, your part is to obey your parents in the Lord. You see, the first commandment was promised was the one that says, honor thy father and thy mother. That thy life may be known, that it may be good with you. That's the first commandment was promised. So children, you have an obligation to obey your parents in the Lord. Amen. That's your obligation. For our parents, fathers, we are to provide for our children their education and their, their health and their, their teaching. We are to provide those things in their lives. Because later on, if we have taught them right and raised them right, there may, become, there may come a time in our lives when they have to do those things for us. And we don't want to be that parent that, hey, man, you treat your kids bad, and next thing you know, you'll be living in the basement when you get older. Better think about that. Better think about how you treat them, parents, fathers. Get out off in that basement. Amen. Take care of them children, treat them right. Teach them, amen. Teach them. Amen. Teach them about this one. Teach them about being responsible, amen. That's our, that's our duty, Father. That's our responsibility to teach those children in the relationship. The children, you ought to obey. We ought to be their example, amen. Not some ball player, not some rapper, amen. With the pants hanging on. Amen. We ought to be that example. Amen. Amen. I can't dunk the ball, but I guarantee you, you talk to my daughters and see you. My dad is my example when it comes to men. And it's something I have to work hard on. And it's something I, 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 I have a compass in now. And I, and I like that. I work, it made me work hard, amen, with those children. Don't tell them I said that. Amen. Today, for just a few minutes, because we talk about the relationship between the father and the children. This morning, for just a few minutes, I'm going to talk about the relationship between the, the mother and the children. My sister said, amen. Between the mother and the children. And to do that, I need you very briefly to turn to Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2, it's not going to take me a long time this morning. Y'all got me hot up here already, amen. I know he's supposed to be turning the heat on, trying to help me get the up here real quick. Hey, turn the heat on, you can just sit down quick. I thought I was doing a good job, amen. 
still out here so you can be there by those two verses, huh? They still won't turn the heat on me. Exodus chapter 2, verse number 1, it says that there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi, and the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bush and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river spring. And the sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. Look at that sister watching out for that brother. And the siblings, amen. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river. And her maidens walked along by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, verse 8, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away, and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses. And she said, Because I drew him out of the water. You said, Brother Bishop, that's not a very good parent taking a child and putting him in a little basket and putting him in the, over in the bushes and what, what kind of example are you talking about here? You have to go back and get the story before mm -hmm. the story, amen. Mm -hmm. You see, a decree had gone out after Joseph had died, there rose up a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph and what he had done for the Egyptians. And after a while, the Egyptians, the, the Hebrews, they, they began to multiply and this Pharaoh from years past, from the time that Joseph had died, he started to look at the children of Israel and he said, suppose uh, we go to war and they align ourselves with our enemy. He says, a bunch of them, like them bishops, amen. It's a bunch of them bishops. Ain't it wrong? A bunch of them bishops. A bunch of them. So now you say you come pull up to our house and throw a bottle up in there, they come down here to child. So many bishops, amen. A bunch of them. So he says, a bunch of those Hebrews, and we need to do something. So he came up with this scheme. They said, what we want to do to stop this is that every time the Hebrew, Hebrew women get pregnant and have a child, if it's a male child, we're going to kill him. Mm -hmm. But this one woman, she said, I'm not having no part of that. So he put out a decree saying that when the Hebrew children are born, the males, that the, the, the nursemaids, uh, they have to take that child, the Hebrew child, and kill him. But those women said, we're not going to make a breach against God. So they told them, they said, you know what, by the time we get over there to try to deliver that baby, they already have him. They, you know, they already have him. They knew that they were not going to make a breach against those children, against God. But the decree still went out that those baby boys were to be killed. So the, Moses, the mother of Moses, what she did, she hid that child for three months, and when she could not hide him anymore, she said, I'm going to turn it over to God. Amen. Amen. And she put that baby in that basket, and Pharaoh's daughter, the king, saw the baby in the basket. She sent for the basket. Moses' sister was watching what was going on. They fetched the basket. She said, this is a Hebrew child. Moses' sister came over and said, would you like me to take him and take him to one of the Hebrew women to nurse him? And she said, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. So she takes this baby right back to put him in the arms of his mother. And now here she is, raising her own son, and she's getting a paycheck for it. <laughs> That's what God can do. Mm -hmm. That's what God did. So this relationship I'm talking about today, as I close here, I'm talking about this relationship between mothers and children. And this is how I see the relationship that, that, that should be, should it exist, this connection that should exist between mothers and children. And I'm going to do whatever I can, regardless of whether it costs me in time, resources, or even my physical condition, to take care of that child. That's what mothers do, brothers. Amen. 
mothers, and I'm not saying something the brothers have done, but mothers will sit by their bed all night long right. with their sick child. That's what mothers do. Mothers will do whatever they have to do in order to make sure that those children have what they need in way of education, in way of medical attention, in way of whatever it may be, mothers will take that extra step. They will go that extra step and we're thankful for them. And we should not wait until once a year on Mother's Day to try to preach a sermon commending them. Because they deserve a lot more. Amen. Our mothers, they deserve more than we can ever give them. That's our part in relationship. Because mothers are special. Yes, sir. Let me close here. Because it, it, it's so much that can be said, and I can't say it all, so I'm just going to say just a little bit. But I think you, you understand what I'm saying. What it took for her to take that child, knowing what would happen if she was discovered, and that was her child, but she took the chance to make sure that, that child had a chance. She said, I don't know what's going to happen to him, but I'm not going to give him up that easy, amen. Right. She was willing to go the extra mile, and sometimes they'll make you want to pull your hair out, but mothers were will are willing to go that extra mile. But sometimes my father was like, hey, pack your bag, let the doorknob hit you. Amen. I don't know what the rest of that says. <laughs> but the mothers say, man, the mothers will go that extra mile for that child. They will risk all, in some cases, and I've seen it, where they have risked all that they had for that child. And others have said, just let him go. Just leave him alone. But mama said, I'm still going to pray for him. That's my baby. Right. That's my baby. That's my child. Amen. That's what mothers do. That's a special relationship between mothers and children. In, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2, very briefly, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 19, uh, it talks about the dedication of a mother. It talked about Hannah and her baby boy Samuel. You see, Hannah was buried and could not have a child, so she prayed to God and her prayer to God said, Lord, if you give me a child, I will devote him to your service. Now, sometimes we ask God something when it comes to pass, amen. We have a case of selective memory loss. Amen. But Hannah had that baby, and after she weaned that baby, she took him up there and dedicated him to the service of the Lord. Mothers, dedicate that child. Dedicate that young boy. Dedicate that young girl to the service of the Lord. And child, if your mother does that, you're on the right path. Amen. Amen. Dedicate him to the service of the Lord like Hannah did. Mm -hmm. Mothers will provide for their children. And in their relationship, children will make provisions for their mother. In John chapter 19, verse 27, Jesus, the last thing he did before he left here, he made provisions for his mother. That's the relationship between a mother and a child that should exist, that I want what's best for them. Do what I have to, to look out for them. I'm a special man. My wife, she could witness the relationship I have with my mother. And I thank her because she never at any time tried to step in between or interfere with my mother and my relationship. The things that I would do for my mother, my wife was always there beside me and agreed with me, supported me. And I thank her so much for that. Amen. Because that can damage a relationship when you come between that child and that mother or that mother and that child. That's a special relationship. Very special relationship. Make provisions for those children and children make provisions for that mother. In John 19, 27, it's before Jesus left him, he looked at John and said, John, he said, son, behold thy mother. Mother, behold thy son. Jesus said, I'm going to make provisions for mama. Before he left her. Dedicate them, mothers, to God's service. Child, you can't ask for anything more than that from your mother. And she's willing to dedicate you and to teach you the ways of the Lord. Make provisions for them, mother. And child, make provisions for your mother in case she ever needs it. Amen.
Somebody I'm mother should be saying, Amen. Amen. Children, Amen. Amen. And then 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Mothers are to help instill faith in their children. Now listen, child, you can't get through this life off your mother's faith only, amen. amen. But mothers can and have a duty and a responsibility to help instill faith in that child. What are you talking about, faith? Believe in God. Teach them about God. I'm going to teach them how to make a three-layer, upside-down, pineapple, chocolate cake, but you don't tell them nothing about God? Teach them about God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Just like you go to those old recipes and all those old home remedies with them. Teach them about God. Help to instill in them a level of faith. Don't let them get out there in the world trying to teach them, amen, about right and wrong and morals. Mama, teach them. That will be pleasing to God. And children, have an appreciation to your mother or for your mother when she's willing to sit down and talk to you about God. Amen. Because see, there are some things that only a mother, amen, can tell a child. Just as there are some things that only a father can instill in a child, there are some things that only a mother can tell a child. And mother, sit down, take time to teach that child. Teach that boy what it means to respect a woman. Teach that young lady what it means to respect her husband. Those are things that a mother, from her perspective, her point of view, will mean all the difference. Because if you don't teach them, amen, don't teach that young girl about how to uh, relate with her husband. You look up, she's going to be in the door knocking. But those two cases, and the children, it's my mama, it's me, and you peek through the door. I know it's you. Mom open the door. What y'all want? <laughs> but if you teach them, amen, teach them you're going to have some hardship in marriage, amen. Things are not going to always go your way. There's going to have to be sacrifices made. Teach them. Or else they're going to be out there knocking. Teach them. That's the mother's responsibility. Children, you have a responsibility to listen when the mother is teaching you. Young ladies, there are certain things that only your mother can teach you, amen. amen. And I pray that you, when you were hearing those things, you were jotting them down in your memory, you were taking notes, because they may come back at a time in your life when you need them the most. Our relationships are so important. There are so many things we talk about between the mother and the child. But let me close with this. And I think this will put everything in perspective about what I'm talking about. There's a story told about the wives of Bavaria. This country, Bavaria, when their country had been besieged and defeated by Emperor Conrad III, the gentle women were permitted to depart, taking with them only what they could carry and value most. Their country had been besieged, had been defeated. But the women, they were allowed to depart. They were given permission to depart. They could only take with them what they could carry and what they valued the most. The story goes that those same gentle women, those same women, took upon their backs their husbands and their children. And the emperor, who had pledged to kill all the men, he let them depart out of respect for their carriage. That's what I'm talking about, mothers. You see, this story, it speaks to the mother's love. This story speaks to the gravity of the seriousness that is associated with a mother and her children. This story speaks to the dedication that a mother has to her children and her children should have to her. This story speaks about the priorities of a mother. This story speaks to the compassions that are held by a mother. This story speaks to the patience that is necessary in order to be a mother. This story speaks to the gentleness and the overall bond between the mother and the child. 
That's mothers, amen. The relationship that should exist between mother and children should be one such as they prioritize their child's well-being. Okay. And children, you have a responsibility to learn and to obey your mother. Because one day, you're going to hear yourself, young ladies, sounding just like your mother in a lot of cases. And young man, one day when you look at that wife sitting across the table from you, you're going to be thinking, I wish she was more like my father. Amen. But they are still the right values and the right things in your life. The relationship between mother and children is one that you better not mess with. Amen. Amen. Don't mess with with the mother's children. You ever seen somebody go between a bear cub and his mother? Mm. A lion cub and the mother? A woman, human, and their child? Oh. Don't want to be in that position. We love our mothers. We respect them. There's a special relationship that exists. And children, we ought to do all that we can because one day, one day, mom's not going to be with us. Mama's not going to be with us. And mama, one day, you're not going to be with that child. So why do you have the time? Spend time teaching that child, instilling values in that child based on God's word. Teach that child about being a godly uh, woman. Teach that child about being a godly man. That's what we owe our children. And set the example before them. Amen? Set the example. Don't let them have to go and look elsewhere for an example. We should be the example. If we're not the example, according to God's word, we need to be getting there. Amen. We need to be getting there. Because God has placed an awesome responsibility in our hands. And children, you respect your mother, you love your mother, you obey your mother, you prepare yourself in life. That if you have to provide for your mother later on, that you are positioned to do that. Amen. 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 And it's not too late. No matter what age you are, it's not too late. If you're here this morning, you're not a child of God, you ought to become one. You see, the greatest thing that a mother can do for the child is to tell them about Jesus, amen? The greatest thing that a child can do for the mother is to tell them about Jesus. You see, that goes both ways right there. Because there are some children who are members of the Church of Christ, there are some children who are not, and there are some mothers who are members, and there are some mothers who are not. But to tell our parents and to tell our children about Jesus Christ and what he did for us. You see, he came from heaven lived among men. They took him and they hung him on that cross at Calvary. And he died on that cross. They took him off that cross and they buried him in a grave. But thanks be to God, he got up. And after three days, he got up. The grave couldn't hold him. He says, Hades would not prevent this church being built. And he got up from that grave. He told his disciples, you go into all the world and you tell this story. You teach this good news you spread this gospel about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when a man, a woman, or a child who's old enough to understand and have right to their mind, when they can hear this and they are willing to believe it, they need to have a change of mind. It's called repentance. It's turning away from what you've been a part of and turning towards God. Then they have to be willing to confess that they believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. He says, if you confess me before men, and I will confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father, which is in heaven. Amen. Amen. You need to be willing to have your sins washed away in the water of your baptism. What does the baptism do? It washes away your sins. You receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You come up, you're born again, and the Lord places you into the family of God. Church of Christ. It's the one man by the fire. It's his body, it's his bride, the one he's coming back for. And just like only eight people saved in the north, so they saved in the Noah's Ark, in the Ark, only those who are in the church when Jesus comes back will be saved. It's his wife, it's his bride. Yes. If I left here and went to Central Mall and paid for the wife of Larry Bishop come to the entrance by the cereal store, and nine or ten women come showing up over there. <laughs> Something wrong. Amen. It's been me but one. Amen. Because I only have one. And there's only one that I'd be willing to lay down my life for. And Jesus laid